Today's sermon is called God Whole. Now, it's kind of a play on words, right? The question is, does God make you whole or do you have a whole, right? Are you a whole person and you feel complete or is there a hole in your heart? And the thing is, is we have different holes in our soul, don't we? I have one called chocolate, and I have to fill that puppy every day, you know. Today, you guys want to know my biggest dilemma was this morning. I live a terrible life, right? It's horrible. I know. I get it. You guys can laugh at me. My dilemma this morning was I grabbed a Snickers bar for breakfast. (laughs) Not the best, but I thought, I'm going to pump up a little calories before I get on the roof, right? So I'm going to eat a Snickers bar for breakfast. I grabbed the Snickers bar, and I looked, and I thought, do I brush my teeth before or after? Because if I eat the Snickers bar, and then I go brush my teeth, it's all yucky, and it's gross. But if I brush my teeth first, and then I eat my Snickers bar, I'm going to have chocolate breath for the rest of the morning, and I might, you know, get kind of close when I'm talking to one of you. I brushed my teeth first, and then I ate the Snickers bar, just in case you're wondering what I ended up doing. But, you know, that's one of the holes in me. It's like an addiction, right? I, I, I want, and I ended, actually I only ended up having two bites of the Snickers bar, and then I wrapped it all up and I put it away. I just needed a bite. That's all I needed. I just needed to fill that little hole with a little bit of chocolate. And some of you, you know, we have these holes in us, and we don't realize that really it's a God hole. See, we're made in God's image. And God doesn't live a solitary life. He has to be in commune with himself, right? That's why there's three parts to God. If you actually read in the book of Genesis in the beginning, it says in the beginning, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. And then when he talks about man, he says, we made man in our image. We. He refers to himself as we. There's all these different places. When God refers to himself, he refers to himself in the plural. Why? Because God is not a solitary being right? So God is in communion with himself. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And since we're made in his image, we need to have part of God's Spirit in us for us to become whole or complete. And if we don't have his Spirit in us, and if we don't invite him to be in us, what ends up happening is there's like this hole, this vacant spot that is like a vacuum, trying to suck in something right? It's craving something. And if we don't recognize that what our body, our soul, our spirit is craving is God, we'll feed it other things, right? I I mean, I think about this, like, you know, we have in our backyard where the downspout goes and the water comes up, a little hole will kind of develop there, right? Well, if you're not careful, things fall into the hole that don't belong, right? Oh, why is this plugged up? Why is it? Oh, a baseball fell in there. The kids were out playing ball, right? And they didn't know where the ball went. Why? It fell into the hole, right? Oh, the grass clippings got in there. Oh, the leaves got in there. Stick got in there. Oh, there's a frog in there. Why? Because it's natural for things to fall into a hole. If there's a, a vacancy there, things that are going to go by that normally would have just went by on the ground are going to fall into a hole. So what are some of the things that fall into us? And sometimes these things fall into us when we're children, right? You know, I've talked to grown men that say, you know, hey, my dad used to smoke cigarettes all the time. And, and, you know, when I was 10 years old and visited him, all you do is smoke. And I'd wait till he wasn't looking. I'd want to grab a cigarette and I'd smoke that cigarette, right? Maybe they were feeling stressed out or lonely or missing their mom while they're visiting their dad. And all of a sudden they grab hold of these cigarettes. You know, we know alcohol, right? We know that young people can grab alcohol. We know... Um, food, right, that's easily accessible. We can grab that to fill in that hole. But we have all these different things. Now, as, as Americans who, you know, people go to therapy, they've done all this research, we know all these things, a lot of these things that become addictions, we're aware of, right? We're aware of NA groups, Narcotics Anonymous, or, or AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. We know that there's things that people struggle with And that the only way they really get help is that 12-step program. What is part of the 12-step? Acknowledging there is a God, right? They call it um, higher, is it the higher being? Higher power, right? Because obviously they want to be inclusive to all religions. And so 
you know, and they want them to have that relief. But we understand that the higher power that is ultimately there that we serve is God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? We know that that is the hole that they had once filled with alcohol or with drugs or with something else that they're filling. They need to fill with God. So what are some other ways? Sometimes, you know, because sometimes people get really judgmental, right? Well, I've never had a problem with alcohol. Well, I never had this. I don't have a God hole. Okay, well, maybe, maybe yours is different, right? Sometimes people want to fill that with being an important person. They want an p- important position or title, right? You know, and so maybe it's like, I want to be the president of the PTO, right? Or I want to be in charge of this neighborhood thing. Or, or at work, I want to be the one in charge. I want to be the supervisor, right? Now, is there anything wrong if God's gifted you with leadership to move up in these areas? No. But... If that's your only source, if you're honest with yourself and you say, I want this because I don't feel important if I don't have it, then there is something there, right? That's something you need to be aware of, right? So filling your life with being an important person, right? Needing compliments. What about that? Has anybody ever put a picture out on Facebook and then you check every five minutes to see if anybody's commented yet or if anybody, how many people have liked it, right? Um... You know, now it's silly because now we have Facebook or social media where people put things on it. But when I was in high school, it was about, you know, first hour. Like, how many people are going to comment on my new outfit, right? If anybody noticed, I got a new haircut, right? If anybody remembers school time, used to either you dreaded it, you know, and wondered if anybody would say something or you were hoping somebody would say something, depending on what situation you were in. So needing compliments. Sometimes we demand those compliments from the people around us, right? If maybe if our spouse or our girlfriend, boyfriend, they don't give us enough attention, right? Have you ever gone through, like, maybe a day or a week? I've talked to people before. Well, I kept track of how many times my spouse touched me. And they, it went a whole week, and they never held my hand. They never gave me a hug. They never touched me, right? Their hole is not being filled because they didn't get enough physical attention, Right? And so that is, that can be a problem for some people. Obviously, we know about food, alcohol, drugs. But what about the demonic? What about like tarot cards or horoscope, right? Well, you know, I seek out somebody that has some sort of connection to the spirit realm. Well, the Bible, you know, talks about, number one, not looking to the dark side, right? We're back to Star Wars and Luke Skywalker. Don't go to the dark side for help, right? But you go to the light. Well, you know, when, when you watch Star Wars, they knew who the Jedi were, right? They knew who the ones were that were one with the Force, that could understand what was going on in the spirit realm, but they were good. We have that biblically in the Christian world. But in the Christian world, because we can read in the book of Acts, when somebody came to Paul at one point, or Peter at one point, and said, hey, I'll pay some money to be able to have this ability you have. Peter was like, heaven forbid, you know, like, absolutely not. We don't do this for money. So because we don't have Christian people put, hanging a little sign up that says, hey, pay me $10, and I'll ask God what's going on in your future, we're not, it's not as commercial, right, as the lady with the tarot cards. So most Christians don't realize that, like, if you go to your pastor, there's prophets, there's people that pray, there's people that can help you. I remember one time, um, this was years ago, I was 18 years old, and this was before cell phones, before GPS tracking, before any of that. There was a group of these young men that was part of this family unit I was with. Nobody knew where they went. And we had called the workplace. They weren't at work. We didn't know where they were. We needed to track them down to tell them something. And I remember all night just kind of praying and praying and praying. And I was at one of the the guy's sister's house. She was worried, sick about them, and they didn't know where they were, and they had to give them a message about what happened with the parents. And I was just praying and praying. And finally, all of a sudden, I felt this release, get in your car and go now. So I told her, I said, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to get in my car and go now. I got in my car I'm like, okay, Lord, which way do I drive? He's like, take a right. Get to that end of that road, take a left. Get to the end of that road, take a right. Get to the end of that road. All of a sudden, I go right by a two-track, and he says, 
look right down there, and there was their car. They were out two-tracking that night. This was up in northern Michigan. They all had the four-wheel drive, and they were out two-tracking. And literally, I had never been two-tracking. <laughs> like, I didn't know where their two-track things were. I didn't know that was something they did. I did after that. I was like, oh, two-tracking is a big thing up here. And I drove down and knocked on their window and said, hey, got a problem. You need to come talk to your sister. And I was able to find them and go back. Now, commercially on TV, what do we see? We see all the psychic can go and track down or figure out a murder mystery. Christians have the same ability to talk to God to find these things out. It's just, it's not commercialized. It's not something like that. Obviously, we're not going to just do it to make a TV show, but we can come to each other when we need that. But instead, like when we have that hole, it's like we're looking to these things. What about sex or pornography or lust? or having many different relationships, right? Like sometimes it's not even a relationship with somebody you're attracted to. Maybe it becomes this manipulative relationship with like a friend or a coworker, and all of a sudden you begin to feel important because it's like, oh, I gave them advice and they did this, makes me feel good. And you begin to fill that God hole, right, with, with something outside of yourself, something from somebody else. Now, I'm sure... I could sit here for an hour and go over a lot more things we use to fill that hole, right? I didn't even talk about Netflix or, you know, our phones, YouTube, social media, right? I mean, it used to be when I was younger, you know how we escaped? We would read a book. I mean, I would stay up till 2 or 3 in the morning reading a book. All kinds, I mean, there's all kinds of books out there. Um, you know, I, use, I like historical fiction and things like that. But, I mean, there's romance novels, there's sci-fi, there's all kinds of things. That, and then it becomes escapism, right? That's what the TV does, reading a book or um, doing something, on, playing those stupid games on our phone. We're trying to escape thinking about everyday life. And so I'm going to fill myself up with this other thing. So we try all these things, but they don't make us complete, do they? It just delays or numbs the pain we feel from this God hole that's in us, right? You can try to fill that hole with stuff. Oh, how about stuff shopping, right? Having things. I mean, you you get to go to some people's houses, you can't even walk through. Why? They're hoarders, right? You got boxes and boxes. And it's like, all this stuff will make me feel better, right? When I go out and about, oh, this is here, let me take it. Do you need that? Nope. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. I have all these things. But it doesn't make us feel complete. All right. So how can we make ourselves feel complete? What do we need to do? Let's look at the scriptures. Now, this passage I'm about to read you is in Luke chapter 12, but you can also find it in the book of Matthew chapter 6. But let's look at the one in Luke. I liked this one here in Luke. It's a little bit long, but you guys can handle it. You guys are good. You guys like hearing God's word. You heard, listen to me talk for 10 minutes. We can have five minutes of scripture, can't we? Let's see. I doubt it'll take me five minutes to read that, but we'll see here. In Luke chapter 12, starting verse 22, Jesus is saying to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and body more than clothes. That's a good thing to remember, isn't it? Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Mary, aren't you crazy for going up on the roof for three days? Aren't you worried about this, this, and that? Jesus told me not to worry. My life is more than what I'm going to be wearing for three days. My life is more than what the food I'm going to eat for three days. I promise you, I could go two weeks without eating and still have a life and have a healthy, wonderful life, and I wouldn't die. Life is more than food. Life is more than clothes. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. Isn't that awesome? They don't, they don't have a house. They don't have a three-bedroom, two-bath house with a nice barn in the back. But they're, they're alive. They live their life. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? We can't, can we? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? 
I like that part. That was kind of like the intro. It's not really what I wanted to get to, but I love that part. God's word's so good. Isn't that good? Okay. Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink, and do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things. And your Father knows that you need them. But seek first, seek him, his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Okay, so here's what I wanted to get to. The passage in Matthew says, Seek ye first his kingdom, and all these other things will be added unto you. And, you know, the verse does go on here. Let me finish it. It says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Okay. So he's telling them all, like, don't be worried about your things. Right? You're filling that hole. You want to look important. You want to have, make sure you have enough to eat. Your mind goes all these places because you, because you got this God hole and you think, well, I'm going to fill it with this. I'm going to fill it with this. And he's saying, don't worry about all that stuff. You really want to be important, have treasures, you know, give to the poor. And then your reward will be up in heaven. But what I love in all of this, that he does tell us what we should be doing besides the laying up treasure in heaven. He says, seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well i love that you know in matthew where i was going to read to you seek it he first the kingdom of god and then all these other things will be added to you okay so what are the things that will be added to us you know the possessions that we think are so important right the clothing the food the treasures right if first we seek him Well, why is that? Because if we seek him first, we fill up that God hole with God and we become whole. We become complete. But instead we do the opposite, don't we? Well, I don't have time for God, Mary, right now. I got to get take classes or I got to work overtime or I've got to do this with my career or I've got to invest in all this other stuff, right? We think that the career will make us whole. We think that, now, and not that you shouldn't have other priorities, right? I'm not by any means saying you can't do anything productive outside of God, but can you get up 10 minutes earlier and spend time with God? Can you make sure, like all of you have done, so obviously I'm preaching the choir here, that you come to church, at least give God one hour out of your week, right? We give our jobs, our careers 40. Can we give God one hour? So number one, he says, seek him first. Seek him first. Hmm. Seek God first. In Colossians 3, 2, it says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. See, when we're trying to fill that hole up and we're grabbing all these other things, we're not looking to help me. What am I going to do here? And it says, you know, Matthew, it says in Luke, it says here in Colossians, Set your mind on things above. What are the things above? Heavenly things right? That's where God is. We know what he means by that. So when we go to God, that's calling out to him even with the little things. Rather than reaching for chocolate this morning, right? I could have, oh God, is this what I need? Yeah, you know, one bite of chocolate this morning is not going to help you or hurt you. It's probably not going to help me either, but it's not going to hurt you. You don't need the whole candy bar, though. You only need two bites. I only needed one bite, but I took the second one, and I really heard God. I'm like, okay, I got my bite. I'm going to put the rest away. I didn't need all of that right in that moment. I wanted it. There's lots of things we do because we want them. Let's look here in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 10. Jesus is saying, Whoever can be trusted with the very little can be trusted with much. Mm, that's really important. You know, God gives us opportunities. Can I be trusted with a candy bar? Or is my flesh going to have me eat the whole thing? That might sound little, but, you know, 
maybe I'm the only one here that thinks it's a big deal to like open up a whole Snickers bar and eat one bite and be able to set it down and walk away. But that is literally showing some self-control over your body. Can we do that? Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Now, some of you might be sitting here saying, oh, I've done that. I've been dishonest with little or I, you know, I, somebody's given me something I didn't do it. Well, guess what? Thankfully, God forgives us and we can move on. The question is, what are you going to do tomorrow with the little? What are you going to do tomorrow with the much? What are you going to do today with somebody else's property? Every day is a new day. It's a new beginning. It's a new hope. It's a new start. It says no one can serve two men. devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Hmm. It goes on. The Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your hearts. What people highly value is detestable in God's sight. What is it that we highly value? What is it that we're seeking? Right? Are we seeking to numb our pain? And that's why we go to some of the different addictions. Are we seeking to feel important? Is our pride want us to feel like, oh, this is so good? What is it that we're seeking? Are we seeking wealth? Well, if I just had another $500, I would be happy. Well, you know what? You probably wouldn't. You probably wouldn't, right? It's not about that next $500. It's not about that next like on Facebook. It's not about the next drink you can get, right? I like this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The question is, if I'm going to seek ye first God then guess what? The money will come, right? The position will come. The adoration will come. But it won't be because I am so great. It'll be because he is so great, and I'm serving him, and he is going to bless me with those things. It doesn't make sense. God doesn't make sense, does it? You know what? He tells me almost every single day when I pray for all of you, Lord, Lord, what should I tell them? What should I, what do they need? And he's just like, love. They need love. I'm like, I've gotten mad at God before. I'm like, you tell me that every time. Like, I cannot get up here and preach every single day. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And he, you know, he says, he says, they need to hear it every week. Why can't you preach it every week? Literally, my sermon today was supposed to be God loves you. I'm like, come on, give me something more than God loves you. But he's like, that's all they need. If they really, truly understood the depth of my love and can fill that hole with his love, if they truly did what Jesus said, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, he said they would walk in peace. They would walk in joy. They would have my wisdom showing them what they need to do as far as finances or relationships or whatever. He goes, all they need is me, is love. I'm like, no, you sound like a Beatles song. I mean, come on, right? Like, all I need is love. Da, 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 da. Right? And he's just like, but it's true. He's like, not the worldly love that the song is talking about. He's like, they need my love. I will make them whole if they just love me. I'm like, oh, all right. So I like this. It says, you cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. Love the other, get it? Or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. So the question is, is, are you devoted to God? In your life, you're devoted to something. Are you devoted to your flesh and what your flesh wants? Oh, I got to give some time to do what my flesh wants. I got to like sleep in. My flesh wants that. Oh, I got to sit here and lay here and watch this. My flesh doesn't want to get up. Oh, you know, I got to feel good. I got to make sure that people compliment my flesh, whatever it might be, right? I got to feed my flesh. I got to give my flesh this. I got to give my flesh that. 
Or are you devoted to God? There's been times where I'm just like, oh, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do today? And he's like, rest. I'm like, really? Like, I wanted to lay in bed all day, but are you telling me it's okay to rest? Yes, when you truly love God, there's going to be days. One day it was supposed to be Sabbath, right? I'm up here on my feet for a couple hours every Sunday. And, you know, so Sunday isn't always my time of rest, but it might be like on Friday, right? That's okay. That's my Sabbath day. It's okay on this moment to rest. There might be other times where God's like, you need to call so-and-so and see how they're doing. It's like, oh, I haven't thought about them for a while. I'll call them up, and it's like, oh, my gosh, right? What a God timing. All right, let's look here, and we'll finish up here. Well, actually, I got two more. Let's look here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. No, chapter 7, verse 24. I love this. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them to practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. What does Jesus tell us? Love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, right? Jesus tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What does Jesus tell us? If you're going to be devoted to a master in your life, make sure it's the right one. So he's saying, look, if you've heard my words and you put it into practice, then you're like a wise man who's built his house upon a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. He says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Hmm. What is the foundation in our life? If the foundation in our life is an addiction, something bad happens, that addiction isn't going to fix it, right? If I got through my life at this point by going to alcohol, and all of a sudden something horrible happens, and I go back to alcohol, that's not going to fix anything. But if the great master I serve is God and a crisis happens and I call out to him and all of a sudden he sends help and he sends what I need, then my situation changes. Jesus wants us to know the truth. He wants us to make him the master in our life. Now, we don't like that word. There's a lot of connotation there. It's not like master, slave type thing. Um, You know, when we look at the original Greek there, they would go to masters or to rabbis or to teachers to give them wisdom. See, we need wisdom so we know how to handle the situation. And instead, we go to escapism to avoid the situation. But we need a master in our life that we can go to and say, what do I do now? I'm not going to avoid this. I'm not going to, you know, go to my addiction. And sometimes our addiction is work, right? Sometimes it's other relationships. Sometimes it's the TV. I'm not going to avoid this. I'm not going to escape this and just hope it goes away. I'm going to go to the master and say, give me your wisdom and show me. What do I do in this situation? So what are some ways we can fill? Number one, set your mind and keep it set. Um, No, make a conscious decision that I'm going to go to God. I might not always remember. Out of habits, I might reach for whatever, but I'm going to go to God. I'm going to write myself a note. I'm going to put it on my bathroom mirror. I'm going to put it in my car. Like the person I need to call is God. I've told you all before, I used to work a job where I'd get out of work. Sometimes I'd be so upset. I'd be like, who am I going to call today? I'd call a different girlfriend to complain about work. And I remember one time grabbing my phone, and it was just like loud and clear as a bell. God was saying, why don't you call me instead of her? I was like, oh. I remember hanging up the phone and setting it down and just talking to God and praying my whole way home. I literally had to put a note in my car during that time of my life to say, call God first. Right? Who are you going to call? to vent to. So number one, set your mind, keep it set. Let God be the first that you go to. Seek him first, right? 
And then number two, or three, I guess that would be, is fill yourself up with God's word. I love this. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but when Jesus was tempted, um, Satan came and tempted him for 40 days after he had fasted. And Satan said, you can just turn that, those stones into bread. You're God. You can do anything. Why don't you do that and eat? Break your fast. Every word out of the mouth of God. And then he began to quote scripture every time he was tempted. You're saying, Mary, sometimes the temptation's so great I can't overcome it. Well, that's because you don't have God's word in you. So just like when Jesus was tempted and he had God's word come out, you don't have any word down in you to come up when you need it. Well, why can't I just go to the Bible and look it up when I'm in a crisis? No, sometimes you can't have a Bible right in a crisis. I've been in the middle of, like, procedures laying there, and I can't move, and all of a sudden I'm, like, crying out to God, and God's word just starts to come up on my mind. Why? Because I've read it, and I've put it down in my heart. Read God's word. Let this be the food that fills up the hole in you. Right? The next time you're like, oh, I'm going to go eat, you know, a pizza. Even though I just had dinner and I don't need any pizza. Well, maybe you just need to pull out God's word and find some scripture in there. And, and feed on that instead. So fill yourself with God's word. And if you're curious as to where to start, I always tell people, have you read the Gospels? What are the Gospels? It's a book. Don't I just start in the beginning and read it through the end? No. The Bible is a library. You have a little, tiny, compact library. Library and read about plumbing when you really need to figure out about relationships, do you? No. What do you do? You go and you find the book you need. So what book do you need? You need the book of John. I encourage all of you to read the book of John if you haven't yet, or if it's been more than six months since you've read the book of John, it's time to read it again. All right, well, before we go, we're going to remember what Christ did on the cross for us as we have communion. We'll have the ushers come forward for communion. Somebody just yesterday at my house asked me, they said, what is communion? It was some young people. They didn't know. And I said, I said well, I said, um, and I talked to them about the children of Israel and how they were saved from Egypt and how the blood of the lamb was put on their doorpost. Go ahead and grab that. Let's bless it. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate this bread and juice for Holy Communion. Father, may your Holy Spirit fill it in the name of Jesus. We pray, remember, and trust in you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And I said, you know, the church there in Egypt were told to take the flesh of the lamb that they had sacrificed and eat it. And the blood was put on the doorposts of their home. And they did that. And the death angel passed over them. See, Satan's still trying to get us, folks. He wants you dead. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to kill you. And we put the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of our heart, over our body. So when Satan tries to come, he has to pass over us. He can't. Why? Because there's already been a sacrifice been done for us. So if you believe in Jesus, if you believe in God, and that he loved you so much that he sent Jesus, you're welcome to participate in communion with us. Now, it takes a little bit of work. You're probably working on this with COVID. Everything's all sealed up and clean. But when you get, all the, get through all those layers, you have a wafer here, and you have some juice. Now, what does that represent? Number one, it represents this body that was broken for us. We see in Isaiah where the prophecies about how the punishment that brought us peace was put on him. By his wounds, we are healed. And so there's three different areas of our life that has been taken care of because of what Jesus did on the cross. Number one, it's forgiveness of our sins, whether that's trespasses or iniquities. And then we also have peace, and that's for our soul. And then healing of our body. See, we were made in God's image, and just like there's three parts of God, there's three parts of mankind, right? Our body, soul, and spirit. 
And even though we sometimes struggle with sin or struggle with things, we know that we are forgiven, that his blood cleanses us. So I can go to God. Because he has forgiven me. We see here in the book of Matthew 26, verse 26, says, While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. So if you've gotten this all taken apart, this is the bread that represents his body. You know, and feel free if you want to to break it. Obviously, when we chew it up, it gets broken as well. But remember that his body was broken for us. Father God, we take this bread and remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. The punishment that brought us peace was put upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. We thank you that he was willing to sacrifice his body for us to receive that healing and that peace. We receive that right now in the name of Jesus. Feel free to take the bread. In verse 26, gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins let us take the cup father god we thank you so much for the forgiveness of sins we thank you that your blood was shed for us that we can be forgiven and made whole help us to receive that wholeness this week help us to not reach just for anything but to reach, take time to read your word this week. Speak to us as we read the book of John. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I hope all of you have a wonderful week. The Blessing Shop is open, and I may be waving from the roof for you next Sunday, depending on how we're doing with the donations by then. But... We will be having God's word worshipped and read here on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So I hope to see you soon. God bless.